Hello, everybody. How is everyone tonight? Good, great. Uh, welcome to the North Vancouver City Library and the NBCL Local Author Series. My name is Heidi Schiller, and I'm a librarian here. Um, I would like to thank the Friends of the Library and the North Shore Writers Association for co-sponsoring this evening. Um, I'm very excited for our reading with JJ Lee and Karen Dodd. Uh, before we get started, I just want to mention that there is a programming guide for the library. It's at the back table, and you're welcome to pick one up before you leave. Um, and our next author event will be on March 26th with poets Dennis Bolin and Joyce Goodwin. Uh, so, without further ado, I would like to introduce Kathy Scrimshaw from the North Shore Writers Association, who will introduce our first reader, Karen Dodd. Ah, thank you, Heidi. Um, it's my very great pleasure to be here tonight to introduce Karen. Uh, she is a fellow member of the North Shore Writers Association, She's a fellow past president and currently our social media coordinator. She's dragging people like me into the 21st century. Um, Karen has reincarnated herself professionally many times during her working life, and she does call herself a serial entrepreneur. She spent three decades working in marketing, was CEO of Global Institute for Small Business Marketing, now, Karen has written hundreds of articles for entrepreneurs. She's a regular columnist for Entrepreneurial Woman magazine. And her books, nonfiction, include The Bliss is in the Breakthrough, From Purpose to Profit by Design, and Smart Women Live Their Why, How Entrepreneurial Women Are Living on Purpose and with Passion. And this just goes right back to the point. I've been telling Karen she's missing the mark here. She's a perfect romance writer. <laughs> uh, and, and I know this because I'm part of her writing critique circle, and I've read all the fiction that she's written. Um, Karen also teaches a workshop on author platforms and how writers can use social media to promote themselves and their writing. Uh, now, Karen and I have been together in our writing circle for about two years. We meet every two weeks, so I've gotten to know her a little bit more than I know some of the other members of the North Shore Writers Association. Um, she's demanding of herself and others. She's one of the most generous people I've ever met. She's businesslike in her approach to writing, and she might talk about that a little bit tonight. She's extremely compassionate. If you're going to find yourself in some kind of a crisis, if Karen's standing next to you, you're going to do fine. Um, and she's also lots of laughs. She's got a great sense of humor. So we have some interesting meetings. Um, when I was working on this introduction, I, I like to throw in little personal anecdotes. But one of the things that Karen it was one of her laws for our writing circle. Everything that happens in the circle stays in the circle, so I can't tell you anything. <laughs> so tonight, she's here to read from her first novel, released in November of last year. It's titled Deadly Switch, A Stone Suspense. Please welcome Karen Dog. Thank you, Kathy. She stayed true to her word. As soon as she found out my husband was going to be in the front row, she said, I can't say anything rude. <laughs> All right. Well, this is, um, this is really a two-part dream come true for me. The first part is um, opening for the great J.J. Lee, and, uh, and you'll know why when you hear him speak, and, and uh, he reads from his book. And uh, the second part of the dream come true is um, back in November of 2011, I had uh, come to, I think it was my first local author series, some of you will recognize the old brochure, and when I came home, I, um, I, I surgically removed whoever was the speaker under Gerhard Winkler, and I put my own picture and write-up, a very good write-up, I might add, um, on, the, on a book that I hadn't 
written yet. And so I posthumously um, apologize to uh, whoever I, <laughs> I killed off out of the brochure of who it was. But I, I stuck it on my bulletin board and, um, and promptly forgot about it. And, uh, and so I just had to check the date, November, that was November 2011, and in November 2013, my book went live on Amazon uh, with the help of a lot of people in this room and a lot of people not in this room. Um, and, and so I'm thrilled to tell you that the average, uh, it's been on eight weeks on Amazon, in print and uh, ebook, and in eight weeks, um, uh, it's averaged four and a half stars out of five out of all the reviews on Goodreads and Amazon. And uh, so far, we've sold uh, 76 of the print books. I'm hoping you'll make that an even hundred tonight. <laughs> And, uh, and on one day, um, just after it launched, uh, we had 248 um, copies of the ebook downloaded. Paid copies, they were not freebies. So I'm very grateful. I feel very blessed um, that, that uh, this has happened. And uh, so tonight, I'm going to read for you a, a couple of places out of my book. And I'm going to read the, um, the Amazon blurb because like most authors, I find it easier to write an entire book than a synopsis. <laughs> I think a lot of us can relate to that. So um, on the, um, it, this is not all on the back of the print book, but uh, who is the man, man found dead with a needle in his arm? What is he doing in Gavin Stone's waterfront mansion? A charismatic international property developer, his estranged and bitter daughter, each obsessed and tormented, both harboring too many secrets. He's on the run, she's in the chase of her life. What they discover changes everything. From the gruesome discovery in an exclusive enclave of West Vancouver, British Columbia, Deadly Switch takes you on a wild ride from Italy's Amalfi Coast to the idyllic seaside town of Carmel, California. Gavin Stone's tormented daughter, Alexis, searches frantically for her missing father, matching wits with devious criminals. With demons of her own to fight, she shouldn't care about proving him innocent of murder and embezzlement, but she does. Murder, intrigue, where's Kathy, a romance, uh, built on a house of cards, this thriller will satisfy your thirst for the adrenaline rush that this intricately plotted story delivers. A, stay, a delicious stay up all night or deadly switch stuns with its heart pounding conclusion. You will not see it coming. So that's easier for me than trying to give you the elevator version of my book. And uh, tonight I'm just going to do three very short selections out of different parts of the book. And uh, I thought I would start with uh, chapter one West Vancouver, British Columbia, February 9, 2013. Even though she was expected, it struck her as peculiar that the wrought iron gate was wide open. Obsessed with security, Gavin Stone had emphasized that she would have to buzz to gain entry. Alexis Layton opened the unlocked front door of the mansion at 70 C Spray Close. She called out as she stepped into the dimly lit foyer. Hello? Is anybody home? Hello? No reply. She pulled herself from her coat pocket found his last text message and hit dial. It rang several times, no answer. She peered into a boldly furnished living room to a wall of glass. Lights glittered from outside, but without venturing farther into the house, there was no way to see where they came from. To her immediate left was a suspended glass and steel staircase. Annoyed, she started up the steps. Who has glass stairs, she mused as her high heels clattered on each tread. It's Alexis, are you up there? Damn it, she knew she shouldn't have come and she just wanted to get this over with. When she was past the first landing and at the top, she saw light spilling from an open doorway. Crossing the threshold from the black hardwood floor of the hall, her heels sank into a plush black and white striped carpet. Judging by the cavernous size of the austere surroundings, it appeared to be the master bedroom. She gasped, gulping for breath. For a second, she thought she caught him in bed at an inopportune time. 
pages stuck together, but he didn't move. Her pulse thundered in her ears, desperately trying to slow down her breathing, she forced herself to move in for a closer look. A naked body sprawled across the king-sized bed. The duvet lay loosely bunched around his feet, averting her eyes from his exposed genitals. Alexis felt her stomach roil as she saw a syringe sticking partway into the man's inside right arm, forearm. Her heart pounded as she stifled a scream. She clenched her shaking hands and took another tentative step toward the bed. His neck and head were twisted at a grotesque angle. He stared with bulging, vacant eyes. White, frothy split spittle had dried in one corner of his partly opened mouth. Recoiling, she lurched backward out of the room and fled for the stairs. In her panic, she stumbled down the glass steps, losing one shoe and then the other on her frantic descent. Her phone flew from her hand and smashed on the floor below as she grabbed for the cold metal banister. Missing the last few stairs, she landed in a heap on the slick marble floor. Willing herself to get up, she bolted through the open front door at lightning speed, stockings ripping on the wet concrete driveway. Her head reverberated with the sound of her own screams. Dizzy, she felt soggy grass underfoot before she vomited and passed out. I wanted to take you on a little bit of a travel log because one of the greatest compliments I got was that people could feel um, the, the villages and towns and locations. And um, so we're, we're jumping ahead here to Tropea in Calabria, Italy, June of 1985. So the book started in 2013 and we've gone backwards. And I wanted to read this because um, it's one of my favorite characters in the book. So it starts with dialogue, the reading, not the chapter. I don't start my chapters with dialogue. Well, it was a converted private school, but now it houses children with emotional problems who come from nearby cities. Some are autistic, but many of them are coping with severe trauma. A nun, who's formerly from the Vatican, runs the house. That's a story in itself. She's brilliant with the children, and of course she has help, but not enough. Catherine looped her arm through Gavin's and led him to the front door, which Jezebel was already pawing excitedly. Catherine reached for the rusted iron door knocker and pumped it up and down several times. A gray-haired woman opened the door and beamed at her unexpected guests. Jezebel, she said in a thickly accented English. Katarina, mia cara, I didn't know you were coming. The nun opened the door wide and ushered them in. Sister Serafina, I hope we're not intruding at the children's dinner time. I'd like you to meet my friend, Gavin Stone. Welcome, Senor Stone, she said, taking his hand in both of hers. The sister looked at Catherine and said, no, no, supper is over and bath time has not yet begun. The children will be most happy to see you. Can you stay for tea? No, we mustn't, but I'd love to see how they're coming along from their last session. Would that be all right, Catherine replied. Of course, Cara. She waved them forward. Come, come with me to the art room. The fo they followed her along as n a narrow stone corridor. As the sister opened a squeaky wooden door, Gavin could hear shrieks of children's laughter coming from inside. When they saw Catherine, several of the smaller ones leapt up and ran to her, nearly mocking her over with their enthusiasm. Katarina, Katarina, they all yelled at once. Gavin couldn't understand the rest of what they said or Catherine's responses back in Italian, but they obviously adored her. Only one little girl remained on her cushion in the middle of the floor. She looked to be about four or five years of age, and unlike the other children, she never looked up from her cramming, completely undistracted by the mayhem. While Sister Serafina tried to quiet the little ones, who thankfully were lost in the fun of climbing all over Jezebel, Catherine walked over to the little girl and knelt beside her. Gavin stood in the doorway and watched. Tula, ciao, come stay. Hello, Tula, how are you? Catherine asked. The little girl showed no sign of hearing and didn't look up. Tula, Catherine said again, still no response. Catherine cupped one hand under the little girl's chin and gently lifted her face to look at hers. Her liquid brown eyes looked pitiful as Catherine softly brushed a dark curl from the child's face. Do you have anything you want to show me today, Tula? 
Catherine asked quietly. Again, there was no reply. Sister Serafina stopped fussing with the other children and watched intently. I'll come again soon, Tua. Perhaps you can show me your painting then, Catherine said. She slowly got up from the floor and walked over to join Serafina and Gavin. She looked back at the child and asked the sister, has she made any progress at all since I was last here? Sadly not, my dear, but give it time. The therapists are working with her every day that they can. It's at God's mercy. We must be patient, yes? The nun put her hand gently on Catherine's arm. And the last reading I'd like to do is um, Tula, grown up, and still in Tropea, Italy in 2013. I'm going to leave a couple of words out so that there's no spoilers. After tucking the sister in and giving her some medication, Tula ushered Alexis to a comfortable but equally cold sitting room. Grateful for the warm tea that helped steady her nerves, Alexis shivered in spite of the dwindling fire in the hearth. She listened in horror as Tula related how, as a child, she had hidden in a closet while Constantine did unspeakable things to her mother, forcing her father to watch. Then she saw him torture her father to death. I don't mean to be rude, Tula, but how can you be so forgiving after seeing Vittorio Constantine's murder, your family in cold blood? The older woman smiled sweetly as if placating an upset child. You heard, Sister Alexis, there's no use poisoning myself and others with such anger and bitterness. But I can't even imagine how you, t how you lived to tell about it. You were just a little girl. How could you not be scarred for life? Well, I did live, but I didn't tell about it. What do you mean? You said the police came and found you hours later cowering in a closet. You must have told them what happened. No, I couldn't. I didn't speak for two years after it happened. She paused to let her words sink in. That's how I met Catherine. She brought me here to this house where I was able to work with psychologists and art therapists. That's what enabled me to speak again. She locked eyes with Alexis. I owe her my life. Alexis obstinately refused to acknowledge Tula's last remark. I made very slow progress at first. I remember wanting so badly to speak. I could form all the sounds in my head, but I just couldn't get let go and say the words out loud. Catherine taught me how to express myself through painting. Now I have exhibits of my work. I'm very blessed. But you didn't speak. What happened? asked Alexis. When Catherine came back to Tropea, your father paid a full-time professional to come with her from Carmel to work with me. After working with Julia, I got so I could talk to myself when I was alone in my room at night. It was so strange to hear my own voice, she said, grinning shyly. Alexis envied Tula's apparent sense of peace. How could anyone experience such horrific violence and not seethe with hatred and a desire for revenge? As if reading her mind, Tula said, I still hadn't spoken out loud to anyone. One day, I was at Catherine's house when she had a visitor. I was in her studio painting, but I could hear her talking to a man out in the, inside the house. There was something about his voice that was so familiar. Tula stared, stared past Alexis as if in a trance. Alexis held her breath, hoping she would be wrong about what Chula was going to say. I came into the kitchen just in time to see him reach out to give Catherine a hug. He was facing me. I still don't remember doing it, but I must have grabbed a butcher knife off the counter and charged at him with it, screaming all my words over and over. Oh my God, Chula, it was him? Alexis gasped. Yes, she nodded. I recognized him. Of course, he had no idea who he was, who I was. What did he do? 
Catherine screamed at me to drop the knife, and I did. She told him I was emotionally disturbed, and she apologized to him and begged him not to call the police. I was so hurt at the time, I felt betrayed by her, but she saved my life. He never knew that I saw what he did to my parents. The police never released that there had been a witness, much less a child, hiding in the closet. Thank you, and uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Heidi for our next guest. Thank you, Karen. I actually do remember um, when Karen came to an author reading after that one in November, and she told me that she had done that with the, the picture in the program, and, um, and here she is, two years later. It's so great. It's really amazing. Um, so I'm actually just going to move this out of the way, one moment. So now I would like to introduce uh, JJ Lee. JJ's book, the Measure of a Man, The Story of a Father, a Son, and a Suit, was shortlisted for the 2011 Governor General's Literary Award for Nonfiction, the 2012 Charles Taylor Prize for Nonfiction, the 2012 BC Book Prizes Hubert Evans Prize for Nonfiction, and the 2012 Hillary Weston Writers Trust Prize. Um, I can also say that my uh, book club here at the library, uh, some of the members are here in the audience, read the book back in October, was it October? I'm looking at Christine, <laughs> she doesn't remember. Um, and I think it may have been one of the most universally liked books at the book club. I mean, there's almost always disagreement, right? But I think everyone at that meeting really loved this book. And I was kind of surprised just because it was about a man and a, his father and suits. And, you know, my book club is all women. So if there are any men here tonight who feel like joining a book club, we need some men to join. But anyway, um, JJ also uh, has fashion and personal essays published in Elle, Canada. Uh, and his memoir piece, L First, You Are Beautiful, tied for gold at the 2011 National Magazine Award for Best Short Feature. Uh, so please join me in welcoming JJ Lee. to try to read a story that uh, some of you, hello, I recognize you, the gentleman over there, I recognize the writers group, North Shore Writers Group, right? Yes? Yes? No? Oh. Uh, there are, well, there are, right? Because there are many members of the North Shore Writers Group. And um, so what I didn't mention, uh, I spoke to the group about my book. It's a, it, it, it weaves memoir. I take my father's last suit. He's deceased. He died. Uh, 13 years ago. I take my father's last suit and I try to remake it to make it fit me. I found it in his closet. And uh, he was a hard man, an alcoholic. And so as I go through this journey of refashioning my father's suit, I tell the story of the, the history of the suit itself and also the history of my apprenticeship as a tailor. And uh, nothing goes well in the book, apparently. Uh, but I, but I, there was a part that I left out um, because it, it was too too difficult to share when I was writing the book. But in November of 2013, early this fall, uh, CBC approached me to write an essay 
uh, as part of Lawrence Hill's uh, Massey lectures. To, it was being appended to it. And so I wrote a story uh, about the idea of blood uh, called Shadows. And it's the missing chapter uh, to the book. So I'm going to offer you that, and then I'll, I'll do the greatest hits from the book later. When the police entered my father's ground floor apartment, they heard the crying first. I'm sure they also detected, as I did later, the smell of urine. Now, I've always imagined a boy, five years old, sitting on the bathroom floor beside my father. My father's body sprawls, his arms akimbo, his arms like the crooks of a swastika or a running man like the victim tape outline on the cover of a murder mystery. The boy cries, and the police constable picks him up. And though he's kindergarten age, I can't shake the idea that he wears a soaked diaper. There was that smell. Maybe he pissed himself. Maybe it, it, it was from when he was a toddler and he wet a mattress. Maybe this is what had become of the smell of my father. My father, when he was young, smelled of vanilla, cigarettes, and sweat. But maybe it had simply come down to the smell of piss. The boy attended the funeral with his two half-sisters. They were 23 and 15 at the time. The boy's mother did not. And I suppose she knew we didn't like her. Not her fault, not really, but there was anger. How could she let herself become entangled in our misery? Did she not see the bottles, the rages? I suppose she made us feel ashamed. Our family lived in Montreal, and when my mother divorced my father in 1991, he moved out west and met the boy's mother. And we knew that my father had brought all his demons to the new relationship. He drank, he shouted, he pushed, he shoved, and worse. History repeating itself. And we were responsible. We made it happen again. We cut our father out of our family. And in doing so, we inflicted him on another. Our private misery would be shared. There was the boy. After the chapel service, we went to a local restaurant, and we ate wings, and drank beer, and I drank lustily, not out of deep sorrow. Not then, not yet. I drank out of relief. We all did. I'm sure we did. My father, who could promise to kill you as easily as he could promise to take you out for an ice cream, could promise no more. I watched my father's boy. He sat between his sisters, but got up and began to walk around the table, visiting his momentarily enlarged family. I saw his face. It had a softness and a fineness that must have belonged to his mother. My father did have a slender look when he was young, but I always saw my father's face as full and heavy-featured, greasy and meaty flesh, a pit bull head. I was 27 years old, and he was 46 when my father told me he was going to have another child. You're going to have a little brother. Half-brother dad. Half-brother. The boy sat beside my father in the last hours. A neighbor said he heard the crying, and when the morning had passed, into a hot August afternoon, and the crying hadn't stopped, the man called the police. The boy spent hours with my father, helpless to do anything. The coroner called weeks later to 
tell me of the lesions on my father's legs, his blood, weakened by years of alcohol abuse, infected by bacteria, had become poison and made his heart stop beating. I have not seen the boy since. He must be 17 years old. I sometimes wonder if he looks like me or my father. Sometimes I fantasize about sweeping back into his life when he's ready. I'll show him how to smoke cigars, not a tie, and other ridiculous shit one picks up from the movies, like how to whittle a stick, overcompensating, lavish promises, foolish, presumptuous plans. Come over for dinner, see a movie, look at our family pictures, let me see yours. The boy whittles a stick and thinks, where the hell have you been? I have been afraid that I will feel the pang of jealousy. He was there when my father died. For some reason that matters. I'm afraid to see the shadow of my father in the boy. And I'm afraid to see the shadow in myself. I am afraid he will see my father in me. That he will look like me when I was young, lanky with greasy hair, a nervous smile, and a painful awkwardness. I, if I pulled him to me and breathed him in, would I know the scent? Blood is secret. Blood is beneath. Blood never lies. So that should have been in the book, but I was too much of a coward at the time um, to, well, maybe I did it for it, my, my half-brother's benefit. He was very young when I wrote the book, and now he's an adult, so I felt more comfortable um, writing it. I'm going to try to do something more fun. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm taking apart my father's last suit, right? I'm uh, hanging out with these tailors in Chinatown, Bill Wong, Jack Wong, of modernized tailors. I told them I could sew. I couldn't really sew. Uh, I spent a year with them. This is for you, Lizbeth. <laughs> Are your lapels sexy? I, okay, lapel is not a sexy word, but as the part of the jacket front that flips open to expose the shirt, and more importantly, the throat and the chest, lapels are positively erotic. They are the suggestive, soft part of the suit. The French call the point where the lapel and the collar meet the gorge, the throat, a lovely word used by the English as well. The gorge suggests mystery, death, danger. One could fall into the gorge and never come back up. Originally, there was no lapel on the coat. A man either wore his coat open or buttoned up over a sternum, not to his neck, which would be dressed with a ruff or a lace collar or a cravat. Then it dawned upon some young men to leave the top buttons open. This practice of artful dishevelment seemed to amplify the dashingness of the suit. It gave the wearer a windswept look, as if his clothes had been slightly undone by vigorous horse riding. <laughs> it became formalized when the front flaps of the coat were permanently folded out. Now, some argue a suit can't be a suit without a good lapel. Anne Hollander, in her authoritative study, Sex and Suits, makes the argument. It's, this is in the 1800. This is the origin of the lapel, very important. <laughs> its collar was forced by clever cut, steaming and stiffening to curve up around the neck, to fold over and open in the front, and to form lapels that would obediently lie down and align smoothly with the body of the coat. This perfectly tailored collar and flat-lying lapel still forms the most distinctive element of the modern suit coat and became the formal signs of modernity in dress. 
Now, I would like to point out Hollander's diction. It is sadomasochistic. It says it all. You can hear the repeated crack of the whip and the slackening of the whip with their use of the word stiffening. Grr. Obediently. Why would a designer denude a garment of these wild energies? Now, uh, I mentioned the lapel is being folded, but actually, uh, one, one thinks of the fold, one thinks of the harsh edge of a paper airplane. True tailors actually call the turning of the lapel from the inside out the roll. Done properly, the lapel will not look folded out at all. Instead, it will roll out like a blooming flower petal. A great lapel should remind one of the bee-stung lips of Angelina Jolie. <laughs> All fullness and sensuality. They are wool labia, opening out with an irresistible lushness. With great lapels, the most masculine article in the man's arsenal, the suit, comes alive with a feminine opening which explains the enduring phallic nature of the essential suit accessory, the necktie. <laughs> <laughs> lapels can be, should be, lapels should be, kinky, dangerous, sleek, potent. To wit, if someone touches your suit sleeve, you're on to something good. If he or she strokes your lapel, the deal has been sealed. Hail a taxi and have at thee. All men, and all women too, deserve beautifully rolled lapels. <laughs> so you can see that's me trying to avoid actually doing any sewing. If you have a waxing point, I get up the lapel. Instead of actually doing the work of um, changing my father's suit. But I did. Uh, it took me a long time. It took a lot of tries. And um, I, I needed help. I got Bill to fix it, even though he didn't know he was fixing my father's suit. Um, I guess I made my piece on some level, but we can talk about that maybe in Q&A. Uh, I'm going to read a part where, uh, so my father and my mother divorced. He took me and my sisters away from my mother for a good long time. This is the first time they split up, not the second time. And uh, eventually we returned back to uh, my hometown. And this is about that revival of our family, that short respite from the good and the bad. My father presumably had dried out and had a job. This is probably the summer of 1985. The su oh, 86, sorry. The summer after I graduated from high school, I got a job at Tarte Julie as a kitchen helper. My previous experience in my father's restaurant ill prepared me to work in a properly run outfit, but I caught on. I worked late, spent my money on comic books and movies, and wondered what college would bring. On my days off, my friend Adrian and I started sparring with two pairs of old boxing gloves, and we spent a good part of August pounding the shit out of each other. And it's funny how being punched in the head can actually be a welcome diversion when you are young. <laughs> One day, Adrian left the gloves in my bedroom, and my father came home early, as was his new habit, but this time, he was hammered. Relapsed into the old ways. He barged into my room, filling the space with that sticky, smoky smell. Whiskey. And it made me hostile and alert. He saw the leather gloves, and he slurred. You want a box? And I made a quick calculation. Despite his physical decline, my father still had thicker arms and broader shoulders. He weighed 160 pounds, more than Sugar Ray Leonard did when he fought Roberto Duran. He might still be strong, but he was also slow. 
The light of the late summer evening flooded into my room and we cleared a space and began. And he landed some heavy punches on my ribs and I pushed him back and I jabbed with my left. And to my surprise and his, his head snapped back twice, then three times. And he patted around and he lunged at me and I pushed him away. And he came forward and we clinched. And I wonder now, what would have happened I just held him at that moment, just wrapped my arms around him and slipped off the gloves and hugged him, bearing his weight. I would have felt the sweat on his cheek and smelled the booze on his breath, but I no longer feared him or what he could do. I would have felt his heart beating madly, and I would have felt mine beating too. He would not have been too heavy for me to bear. I could have said, come on, Pa, sit down. You've been drinking. Instead, I jabbed hard with my left, and I hooked with my right, and I caught him on the temple. And he straightened up, and I began to sting him in the forehead, and he staggered back with a crash. His body slamming the bedroom door shut. Oh, God. I smiled when it happened, but I really wanted to cry. I took off my gloves, but I couldn't get out. He was blocking the way. So I dragged him by his feet to the middle of the room and left him sprawled there on the floor. I climbed over his body, and I shut the door behind me. Is there time? Yes. There is? About, yeah, you have 10, 15 minutes. OK. Yeah. I'm going to give you just one read. I don't think, I don't know how long it's going to be. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll be short. I promise you that. So uh, this is a part that's been really hard for me to read, but I'm going to try it because things change. We had a we had a moment. Uh, we had a moment the last time I saw him before he died. The last time I saw him. This is the end of the book. I don't care. <laughs> there's no there's no, there's no spoiler alert. <laughs> um, but I finished the suit, kind of. I'm not sure what you would think if you saw me in my father's suit. I would like you to think I cut an elegant figure, that it would be great if you thought I looked comfortable and wore it effortlessly, that I could be nothing less than a suit-wearing kind of man. If I gave off a whiff of desperation or pompousness, I would be disappointed. I would rather be keen and bright than preening. Indomitable would be preferred to overblown and insecure. But I'm chasing what can't be caught. I don't know what makes for a good suit. I can tell you if it fits you. I can tell you if the cut is current. What I can't tell you is how the suit will behave in the wild, out there on the streets, across the candlelit table, at the wedding chapel, in the dock of the boardroom. When I look again at the picture of my father, my uncle, and my great-grandfather in Sherbrooke, Quebec, in the late 1950s, I see they were not very well dressed in suits. But I like it, because it captures the intergenerational nature. A suit is something passed from one generation to the next. The knowledge passed down is a code it's about knots and sleeve lengths and which buttons to close and which to leave open. But in reality, what is shared is an acknowledgement. Son, you're going to need this one day. Maybe not now, but one day. Most fathers will know nothing about the martial origins of the suit, how its lines have a uncanny resemblance to plate armor. Fathers won't be able to tell you the most masculine article in a man's sartorial arsenal comes with a feminine opening. They won't be able to tell you. 
they won't be able to tell you about the contradictions. I look at a picture of my father at the Kantiki. He's 21 years old. Before he was an alcoholic. Before he suffered from depression. Before he died. My father is elegant, effortless, debonair, pompous, overblown, achingly too young. I look at the picture and he remains an enigma. I'm a child again. My father reaches around me. His sleeves are rolled. He hunches so his face hovers over my shoulder, right next to mine. This is our second try at learning how to tie a tie. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Now you loop it over. He's loud. He's loud, man. Now you loop it over to one side. Like this? Yeah, that's right. That's how you make a half Windsor. I look like you now. One day, one day you might. Just practice it, and you can use it on important days. When you wear a suit like Daddy. Why? Because I want you to be ready. Ready for what? Anything, son. Um, so we do have some time for questions. I'm just going to ask you both to come up. Oh no! <laughs> so um, I actually have a question for JJ. Sure that doesn't really have anything to do with your book. <laughs> but more, um, I'm curious It would have been $105,000 if I won all the prizes. It would have been $105,000. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't get it. Is that the question? No. That's, the, that's on my mind yeah. every day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to ask you about the Kantiki Award. Yeah. Um, because you have been doing this for so long, and you have the it's been getting a lot of attention for the cut of the men's clothes. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if you've seen it and no, what can you... No, tell me about it? The oh, about no, okay. Tell me what's distinct about it. Well, the, the men's, all of the men's pants are very high-waisted, yep. and there are no ties in the movie at all, yep. and there are no um, patterns okay. at all. Yep. And supposedly it takes place, you know, sort of slightly yep. in the future. So I guess, um, how do you see men's suiting I can answer that. Actually, I did hear I did I did hear about the high waisting of the suits in uh, her. Uh, actually, it, it, if you go shopping right now, you're going to still find the the low slung um, jean height pant. But be very careful if you buy a suit because what's happening is that what happened is that the the, the, the closure point of the suit went up and the waistline went down and the triangle of white kept getting bigger and bigger. And bigger. <laughs> the pants are down here and the buttons here. So. Don't do that. I actually wear high-waisted pants. I, I'm, it's right at my belly button. And I suggest if you don't want that sort of awful, gigantic triangle poking out all the time, you know, uh, to just get a normal suit. Don't. You shouldn't look for a suit that feels like a pair of So the high-waisted, first of all, the future part, high-waisted pants are coming back, pleats are coming back, the, the, the turnover is coming back, but there'll be a much more narrow profile. Uh, oh, no, it was a point that was going to uh, so the uh, but and so yeah so go yeah, this is the part you don't wear a suit that is cut like a pair of jeans or a jean jacket the trick with, with suit wearing is you wear a suit as if you were wearing a pair of jeans you wear it like you wear it every day and that's the secret to looking great in the suit one of the most like I were, if you could sleep in a suit that's what James Bond did Sean Connery did that before <laughs> yep. Yeah. He wore, he wore, he slept in the suit for seven days. None of us were watching oh, him in yeah. his clothes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we get so risque here at the end of the author series. Um, any questions for these two? I can't tell you anything about suits. <laughs> With the places that are so very much alive, both in West End, North Shore, 
and Italy. I assume you've been both, you know, been to Italy and no, I'm going for the first time in oh. April. Oh my God! I haven't been there. No, a lot of research. Um, we're very fortunate that uh, a very good friend of ours um, is Italian and goes there every summer. So uh, I'm actually a little nervous right now because he's reading the book and I know he took some literary license. <laughs> and uh, we have wonderful neighbors here, um, Anna who is Italian and her husband who's almost fluent. And, uh, <laughs> and so I had great uh, proofreaders as well. But thank you for that compliment because um, uh, I haven't been there. What was it like? Was it hard to do that, or was it easy? No, I, it was easy. Yeah. I um, I don't know. I just felt it, and I just I know that there are some fictionalized locations and restaurants and things, but did I just Google felt it. it. Uh, did you Google map it? Like, um, did you go along the streets that go along? The I I did a lot on the internet, but I'm not good with maps, <laughs> JJ. <laughs> That was just like way too overwhelming. <laughs> but uh, that's a great resource. A lot of authors use that. A lot of writers use that. Right? I, feel, I like that restaurant. I'm just, I just use that. Yeah. Sign Carmel, well. I, I, know, I know very well. And, uh, and of course, uh, Vancouver and West Vancouver. And um, the sequel, which I'm writing now, I'm on chapter seven, is, um, is uh, starting in West Van again. Yeah. How did you uh, come to uh, select your publisher? Take care. And now I'll pass and it over to JJ because we're opposite. JJ is traditionally published um, by a very well-known publisher, and uh, and I'd still love to tell you the tape measure story. And I self-published um, with Amazon with their two companies. The ebook is um, is uh, on KD through KDP Select. And the print version that you see is through Create Space. Both are owned by Amazon. Um, I decided at my ripe old age, older than JJ, I, I didn't want to shop around for um, and wait for my 130 rejections. He probably didn't get that many. Probably didn't get any. And uh, I wanted to have more than one book under my belt before I croak. So <laughs> that's that's my answer. I'm the word. Uh, so I publish with McClelland and Stewart, which is now part of the Random Penguin uh, Corporation. Um, I was approached to write the book after uh, a movie that I was in called um, Taylor Made, which was my year as an apprentice at Bill and Jack Wong's at Modernized Taylor's, was aired. And then my own documentary on CBC Ideas aired called The Measure of a Man, and it was my social history of the suit. And so uh, I'll tell you, it's a good story. There's like two, two stories now. So uh, I get up, I'm working at, it sounds like, I was a CBC producer, right? So I'm at CBC, and one day I'm working at Sounds Like Canada, and someone calls and says, Oh, I'm Anita Chong, I'm an editor at McClellan and Stewart. And I'm like, Oh my God, is he going to pitch a book to me? Like, to get on air, to, you know, author interview, all that stuff. And I'm like, Yes, what do you want? Because, well, I just heard this movie, and it's like, Yeah, fine, fine, what do you want? Like, who do you want on air? What show, what time do you want them on? And, you know? And then she goes, no, no, I want you to write a book. And I go, no, I got a job. <laughs> and I, and you go, she goes, no, no, no. It's like, I, I, I said, I did the movie. I did the documentary. I have nothing more to say about suits. I just don't want to do anymore. And uh, she goes, you know, you don't know what it's like to hold a book that you wrote that's published in your hands. And I said, do you know what we do with published books at the CBC? We, we use them to hold up our shelves. <laughs> and the reason why is, it's, it, you know, we, we, CBC does a great job with books, but we get a lot of books, and I never imagined that my book would get the time of day. You know, like it's, you gotta hustle to get your book noticed, right? And I, never, I just didn't want to be one of the books. On the CBC third floor was a table. It's the table where one puts the books that they don't want there, and it goes into a giant, mountain in front of the elevator like it's literally dangerous to walk by it right because it's so high and as christmas comes it gets shorter and shorter and that's the only time it gets smaller otherwise it just gets bigger so these are all the unread untouched books that can happen and i, and I assumed that would be one of those untouched books right so i said no uh, but then sounds like canada was cancelled and so i called anita and said you know i've been thinking about that book idea <laughs> 
Uh, now the other thing is, so I did write a pitch. I wrote the first chapter. It was my first my pitch document, and immediately the book was accepted, and I had a year to write it. Uh, and then this uh, during that period, is this this uh, book design came out, uh, and you notice there's a measuring tape, and this is the story Karen wants me to tell. So originally the draft document had a measuring tape that went from four to twelve inches, and I emailed back. I said I love the design of the book, but maybe we should use chest measures instead. The measure of measure man, right? So, uh, yeah, that's what's right. <laughs> She wanted the relationship part. She really, it was, it's funny, um, it was really didn't want to write that part, right? Uh, it was very difficult. But in the end, it was actually easier to produce the chapters about my father than it was to write the social history. And the book deal nearly fell apart because I couldn't actually write the, the social history. And it took a lot of, I, I found inspiration in four books. Uh, Julie and Julia uh, by Julie Powell. Kitchen Confidential by Anthony Bourdain, uh, a book called The Guitar, An American Journey, and all these books jump between ideas, right? The Kitchen Confidential is more tonality. I was looking, like I needed to, how could I show the reality of working as an apprentice? There's a lot of crazy things that happened in the shop. And I, didn't, I was, wasn't brave enough until I read Kitchen, Confiden Kitchen Confidential. Then I learned, okay, that's how you write about business and about the work environment in a way that captures people's imagination. And so lapels owes a lot to Anthony Bourdain and that gut lusty way of writing about food. was uh, I needed to be lusty about clothes. And I am, so it made it easy. Yeah, that's great. Did I have to put that Yeah, that was easy, right? Yeah. Okay, well. Uh, thank you both again so much. This was a delightful evening. Um, and uh, please stay. I'll open the windows back up. I think the skateboarders are gone. And please have a glass of wine, um, have some cheese and grapes. And I'm sure that Karen and JJ would be more than happy to uh, sell and sign books. So thank you very much, everyone. And we will see you in March. Thank you, guys.